Sorry for the technical problems. Uh, this is my various contact information. I'm not going to have it at the end, so um, if you're going to want to look at my source code or whatnot, you might want to take a note of it now. Um, I'm going to talk today about Utree, which is a um, generic tree structure that we've recently added to Spirit. And so this talk is going to basically break down into five parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about some stuff that motivated us to originally do Utree that uh, Hartmut and Joel didn't get to in their talk last year. Um, then, uh, just quick poll: Who here is taking a compile or course at a like university? And who here has worked on a compiler outside of school? Okay. Um, so we can, we're probably a little pressed for time. Uh, we can skip over the introduction to the compiler part if you guys want. Um, or I can still do that. Uh, okay. That's, don't want to skip that. All right, so. This is a pretty typical um, query grammar. This is the canonical example um, of a parser for a calculator. And this is just uh, without any attributes. Um, and so you have something like this. And what we've wanted to do for a while is have a tool that can allow us to dynamically create grammars in a Lisp-like syntax and then be able to eventually generate code like this from them. Um, and we call this dynamic spirit. And Joe and Hartman originally wrote this uh, last year. And so the syntax looks something like this. And uh, the, the code gen of spirit code is not something that uh, we ever got around to implementing. But uh, in the spirit repository, we actually have a dynamic spirit um, tool that can uh, parse this grammar and execute it. So this this is the original motivation for Utree is that we wrote it um, as a backend to this parser. Okay, so um, semantic actions. Semantic actions are evil, and I would like people to stop using semantic actions unless absolutely necessary in their spirit grammars. My reason for this is that one, it's harder to read a grammar when you've got semantic actions. Two, it pollutes the attribute grammar. As in, if, if you see here, we've got an attribute of int. The only reason that that attribute works is because of the semantic actions. Because otherwise, it would actually be a std vector of ints because of the clean stars that we have in there. So I don't have a problem with manipulating the attribute grammar, I just would like people to do it explicitly instead of having it done implicitly by semantic actions. Um, also, um, I don't like it when people write grammars where you don't have um, your, the primitives of your AST. In this case, a plus node, a minus node, um, a, subtra a division node, a multiplication node, a urinary negation, um, a positive node. <laughs> Whatever, I can't pronounce things. <laughs> I'm really bad at pronouncing things. You'll have to forgive me for that. Um, and then we, have, of course, have our terminals. So in this grammar, some of our, 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 the atoms of our AST are not their own separate rules. Like, as you can see, uh, they're in the term and factor and um, expression rule. So um, why I want people to not use semantic actions? Because it makes it easier for people to maintain your grammar if the actual grammar portion is as readable as possible. I would, I would, rather, have the semant I would rather have people write their semantics away from the actual DSL of spirit. Because I want the actual grammar to be as simple as possible to read. And also, I'm an attribute grammar purist, and I st I, I'm very strong in the idea that if you're going to mutate the attribute grammar rules, you should have to do it explicitly. 
So if we remove the semantic actions, the grammar becomes easier to read, but uh, we lose all of our semantic information. We just get a vector of ints, and we don't know the operations that we meant to do with these ints. So this is a completely meaningless grammar. All right, so we'll, we'll continue even though this grammar is completely meaningless, and we'll move the various first-class citizens into their own separate rules. And I'll get into why I'm doing that a, more later. But we, we've still got the problem of we don't have any semantic information, and if we're, we're not supposed to use semantic actions, then what are we supposed to do? And the answer is that I want people to use the attribute grammar. What I mean by that is that I want people to, instead of writing semantic actions, I want them, you to um, specialize the spirit customization points to get the desired behavior um, from spirit. Spirit's um, almost completely configurable through a, a set of cu customization points, which admittedly not all of them are well documented, but that's something that we're working on. And the reason you, you, can, you can do tree building and you can gather semantic information through the use of attributes. All right, so um, for anybody who's not aware of what a spirit style um, customization point is, usually they look something like this, where you have a template class that has a static um, method usually called call and then you might have some overloads, and then you have a dispatch fun function which is in spirit. So then the user can specialize the customization point and um, you can get your desired behavior. All right, so how do we associate actions with a rule by modifying the attribute grammar? First of all, you want to figure out what your actual, the right-hand side attribute is. Um, then you're, you're going to want to create a type that holds both the actual attribute and whatever semantic information you want to store. And this usually means specializing um, the transform attribute special, um, customization point in spirit. And then you want to specify the type that you've created as the attribute of your rule. And this way you can, you can associate an action with a rule by associating a specific attribute with it. Um, this is a simple example, uh, well, this is the first half of a simple example of how to use a spirit customization point. So you've got some um, client class, some data, and you want to use it as a fusion sequence. So you do this, you specialize the transform attribute, and there's, there's three separate hooks in transform attribute. There's a pre hook, which is called before, before parsing. Um, there's post, which is called after parsing. And there's fail, which is called if the parsing fails. So what you can do here is it passes you in pre, it expects you to return the actual right hand side attribute. And it'll, you'll take in a reference to your attribute. So what you have to do is you have to um, whatever attribute you're returning is what's going to be parsed into. That's the actual attribute that'll be used. So then in post, um, you you get the um, actual attribute that you've specified as well as the right hand side attribute. And you can use one of these hooks or neither of these hooks or both. Um, and this way you can, you can plug into the parsing process both before and after the actual parsing operation has happened. Um, this is another example of doing a, an attribute transform. This one's for karma. Um, it's relatively simple. This is, uh, you know, you've, you've taken the type and notice that I'm not doing anything with the actual attribute. The attribute is just a tag. I know that the attribute is always going to be unused. Yeah? On that last slide, the, the fail method, does that call when the rule fails or when something else fails? 
and the pausing of the right hand side of the rule fails. Okay. So if, if, if anything in the right hand side of the rule is to fail, um, it would not be called if an expectation point was not met. I'm pretty sure it would just throw. Right, Hartman? All right, so the problem with writing, you know, with implementing your semantics this way is that you need to have these, you have to first, you have to have these specializations of the spirit points, which are not wonderfully documented. Um, and you need to have some sort of tree structure um, that's a, a generic tree structure that you can work with. And this is, you know, it, unless you have a somewhat involved grammar, there's not a lot of motivation to not use semantic actions. But, uh, so that's, that's why we've wanted to design Utree. All right, so our requirements for Utree where it needed to be um, lightweight, limited use of virtual functions and runtime type information, minimal memory footprint, minimal dependencies, and you need to have a dynamic type system, and you need to have a method of extending the set of types that can be represented by a U tree. All right, so these are the built-in types that a U tree can represent. You've got uh, a list which is a list of other U-trees. Um, U-tree fulfills um, STL container. And you've, you can have a list range. You can have a reference to another U-tree. Booleans, um, floating point units, integers. You can have ar a string of arbitrary binary data. Um, you can store symbols, strings, string ranges. There's a nil node and an invalid node. Um, the, dis the distinction between those two is that an invalid node would be in uninitialized node, where a, no, and a nil node would be an empty node. Um, we've also got the ability to store a function that inherits, there's a base class function base that it needs to inherit from, um, and the, the call signatures, it has to return the U-tree and it has to take a scope class. And you can also store an arbitrary pointer, um, which is the type safety for said arbitrary pointer is provided through runtime type information, um, just a pointer comparison of the strings returned by type ID. So Utree is implemented with a discriminated union, um, which means we've got a, a union that, uh, just like a C style union, and we've, we've specifically um, set the size of all the Utree types such that we know that there's a certain number of bit bytes that we can use to store the actual type of the U tree. <laughs> um, so the, the size of the U tree is its um, size of void for its size of four pointers. Um, and uh, the last few bits hold the type information. So the, the, the U tree type is, is a completely different concept from a C++ type in that all U-tree types are represented by U-tree instances. Um, so the, all the type safety has to be provided by checks in U-tree um, and by checks in your own user code. Um, it's got an STL-like interface and it, the, the strings, um, we actually we store the strings if they're small enough we just store them in the union just instead of allocating them and then storing a pointer to the allocated string. Um, and if, it grow, if the string grows to be large enough, then we, um, we put it on the heap and we store the pointer that points to the string. And one of the things that Utree supports is boost variant style visitation, which means that you can, you can apply a function object to a Utree and the underlying type um, of the data will be passed to the function object. So the function object has to have a, um, an operator overload for every type or it needs to have an operator, um, a call operator that will work for every type. And that is the, the visitation mechanism is how we, we do things like 
um, write a compiler pass with uTree or how we, we interpret a uTree. So the extensibility mechanism in uTree is the ability, have, there's this ability to store an arbitrary tag in uTree. Um, the size of the tag is it's actually a little bit more than three-fourths of a uh, pointer. Um, it's, it's four bytes less because we have to store the type of the um, uTree. But so you can, you can almost store a complete pointer in that tag. Um, the design strategy that we, we've come up with is to use a table, um, some sort of vector, where you've got the tag of each uTree refers to a index in the vector, and that the vector holds um, more information. So this allows you to store an uh, arbitrary amount of um, metadata about the uTree. Uh, for example, I have a, a library which is built around uTree called Prana, which um, the, for, uh, the, the source location is stored in the annotation table. And for parsers that need to store extra metadata, for example, um, a JavaScript object notation parser, where you have both objects and arrays, that's kind of tricky to represent in uTree because you only have one list type. So what I do is the, the annotations table holds an enumerated value that's either um, you know, zero for object and one for array. So that allows us to differentiate which um, type of JSON object um, a particular uTree list is. All right, so if we take that, fa that grammar from before, the uh, calculator grammar, we can use uTree as the attribute for all of these nodes. And if we make all of the, uh, the operators characters instead of literals, then we get them in the uTree, and we're, we're kind of in a good place. The problem, though, is that when we say care, care um, underscore here, it's passing an attribute of string to the uTree. And that by default, if uTree is constructed with a string, it creates a uTree string. We don't want a uTree string here. We want a uTree symbol. The, the distinction is um, we assume that in most programming languages, there's a distinction between a keyword and a string literal. So uTree has two different representations of string. So the question is, how do we tell the, how do we tell Qui that we want those characters to be stored as symbols? Uh, yeah, that's basically just what I said. So um, what we can do is we can use the type UTF-8 symbol type. And this is a type that is, you can treat it as an std string. It inherits from std string. The only difference from std string and UTF-8 symbol type is that UTF-8 symbol type has different specialization points in Qui. So for the rules that take a UTF-8 symbol type, um, they can take a uTree as their attribute instance. But instead of creating a uTree string, they'll create a uTree symbol. So this is one example of how in uTree we use the attribute grammar to implement specific semantics. And if you notice, we've, by moving the actual operators into a separate rule, we're able to associate a specific um, attribute with them, which associates a specific action with them. So the, the, the reason why I feel that it's important to have your, it's important to have more rules and to have rules for each of your atoms in the in your AST is that it allows you if you have when you have a rule you can associate an action with it through an attribute. Go back I'm gonna finish looking at what you've got. Are there uh, are there any questions or? I just think it's that you have multi-character uh, yeah, that maybe should be a string. Uh, uh, um, the, the question was, it, he um, remarked that it was strange that I had multi-character literals in there. That should be a, uh, a string, because that's meant to be a 
the um, care parser there is meant to match either a plus or a minus. So yeah, that's my bad. All right, is everybody? Okay, so uh, it's again what I just explained. So um, now I'm gonna um, go into an example, which is a Lisp interpreter implemented with Utree. Um, I'm not going to talk about the parser for the um, Utree for, for this Lisp much because it's it's relatively simple. Um, I mean, Lisp is like the easiest thing in the world to parse. And the the important thing is, I'm pretty sure everybody here knows how to write um, a Spirit grammar, but what I want to show people is how to use Utree after you've generated it, how you use it to do other stuff outside of parsing. So um, I'm not going to talk about the entire Lisp implementation that we've come up with, um, mostly because half of it's broken. Um, Can I ask a yeah. person, why are you doing the Lisp implementation? I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun. That's essentially uh, the the actual reason um, why I started talking about this in the beginning. I'll go back to oh, um, is that we came up with this idea of this thing called it's really in the called dynamic spirit, which is a interpreter that can interpret um, a s syntax that is similar to spirit, um, so that we can test out grammars and then eventually it would presumably generate. Um, a grammar from this Lisp on the Lisp syntax on the right here. Uh, plus, I like Lisp. Okay, so um, these are the four operations that we'll be talking about in our little Lisp here today. Um, I've left out things like define and let because I basically consider them syntactic sugar. Um, I mean, it's, it all comes down to having lambda expressions. And uh, outside of lambda expressions, you can pretty much build everything on top of that, assuming you have a macro system. Uh, the macro system, another thing I won't be talking about due to uh, lack of feature completeness. So there's, there's four different, um, there's three different expression types and then four primitive procedures that are in this little lisp. We have lambda expressions. We have variable references. We have procedure calls. So this is a, um, a lambda expression, and this is a diagram of how you treat would parse it. We've got the top node there is a list of, um, of, of the, it's the, the root, and it's got a list of all the elements. On the left, we've got a lambda symbol. Then we've got the formals. Um, which is, we've only got one, it's x. And then we have the body, which is times x2. And then all of um, the, the symbol um, times the symbol x and the number 2. So um, the, the lambda expressions that we have here and the procedures that we have here are scheme style um, procedures and lambdas, which means that they're lexically, lexically scoped. Um, the problem when you have lexically scoped um, first class functions is that you need to have clo they need to be closures. Scheme um, in scheme basically procedures are closures, so there's there's no real trick there because it's just a language feature. Um, so what is a closure? A closure is a function in a referenced environment. It's the referenced environment from when the function was evaluated. And this, it's important that you have this referenced environment because you, you might refer to free variables. If you have a nested function, it might refer to a, a pr uh, variable in its parent. So then if you return that function, that variable has to remain alive and the function has to, the nested function that you've returned has to have a way to access it. So a procedure call consists of extending the referenced environment by binding the local variables, the formals of the function, to their corresponding arguments. And then you um, just attach that onto the referenced environment. So this is um, an example of what that looks like. So we've got a global environment. 
which is, in this case, it's just an empty environment. And then we have the first lambda, which is when it's evaluated, it creates environment one. Um, and well, when the procedure that the lambda creates is evaluated, environment one is created. And in environment one, x is bound to two. The little dashed line indicates uh, creation. So the, the two little circles on the right are the procedure itself, because the procedure is a function and a reference to an environment. So the first lambda that's evaluated refers to the global environment, because it's at the top level. And it's got its body there. Now the second lambda, it's referring to environment one. And its body is the plus xy. So the, the trick here is that e1 has been created in the first lambda, and the first lambda will go out of scope before the second lambda is executed. Because the, um, I'm not sure how easy that uh, S expression is to read, but you, you have the, uh, is there like a laser pointer? Remote on the oh. Under there, underneath, underneath. Oh. on the shelf. Yeah. Oh, thanks. How do I, how do I use this? Okay. So, what happens when this is evaluated is first, we, we look at the first, uh, the first S expression here. Um, the top, at the top level, you've got a list of two elements. This thing, and then three. So, in, in Lisp, you evaluate by, by saying, okay, we evaluate the operator, then we evaluate the arguments. So then we go and we evaluate the, the first argument, which is not a, a name of a function, um, but it is, in fact, a, a, a lambda at the call site. So then you, you go in here and um, we, we parse the body here and we create the procedure. The procedure is returned, and then you evaluate the second argument at the top level, the three, and then you call the procedure with the three. When you call that procedure, that procedure, um, the procedure's body is invoked. So then this lambda is invoked. And we've got the two here at the end of this body. So this lambda is invoked, and it's evaluated, and then it's, it's executed. Uh, or it's, it's actually, it's returned, and then, and then um, executed after this lambda's left its scope. Aren't the values of x and y in your two environments reversed? X is three and y is two. That that's that's accurate. You need to repeat that too. Right? Um, yeah, yes. The um, Rob was just asking if the values in the environments were reversed, and that's correct. That I had made that mistake. So um, the answer to managing the lifetime of environments that I've found is just to make copious use of Boost Smart Pointer. Um, I basically put anything that's going to be shared between um, environments or between functions in a smart pointer or in a, smart or in, in a shared array. So I, I consider Boost Smart Pointer to be an essential building block of any um, interpreter or compiler that you're writing with Spirit because you, you need, regardless of what, what you're parsing or compiling, you, when you're working with a tree data structure, you need a way to manage your memory that's not painful. Um, anything that's a hierarchical tree is pretty much got to be in the heap. And it, it's a lot easier to just use Boost Smart Pointer than to try to manage your memory yourself. Yeah? What about cyclic dependencies here? Um, yes, cyclic dependencies are fun. Um, the, I mean, for a recursive call, what, what I do is I just, because there's only going to be one cyclic dependency in a recursive call. When you've got an environment, um, you know, you, you have, if you have the, the name of the function in that environment and it's the environment for that function, obviously that's going to create a cyclic dependency. So the solution there is just that because I know there's only going to be one um, such variable there that can have a cyclic dependency, I just put it in a weak pointer in the environment. But uh, the other solution is just when the top level environment exits, you just go through um, all the smart pointers and clear their data. Um, 
So, I mean, there's, there are better ways to detect psychoic dependencies. Um, but I, I personally think that using reference counting is um, easier than using tracing garbage collection, if only because there isn't a boost implementation of a tracing garbage collector that I know of. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about this. Um, I'm going to go through the actual source code of this Lisp. Um, and it, it, my apologies if it's, if it's hard to follow. I, I tried to compact it down into these slides. It was only like uh, a thousand or so lines. Um, but so whenever I, I write a program, I always go through and I make a chart of what my algorithms are and what my data structures are. Um, this is a, a quote from the uh, Fusion documentation, algorithms plus data structures equals programs. So our data structures are, first of all, we've got a signature, um, which is metadata about a function. The already of the function, if it's fixed or not. Um, for our purposes, we're going to ignore things like calling conventions. Um, and also it has a function type. You need to know if a function, if a, a U-tree node that holds a function, if it's a lambda, if it's a placeholder, because you'll need to know that later in the evaluation. So we actually have two different types of environments, um, which are poorly named, because one's called environment and one's called scope. Environment is the compile time environment, which is backed by a boost on ordered map and is doing string lookups. Scope is a runtime environment that's using lexical addressing, which means that instead of looking up a variable by its, its name, it just knows, oh, that variable is two frames up, and it's the third variable in two frames up. We also have an evaluator, which is a U-tree visitor object, and that holds both an environment and a global procedure table. A global procedure table is basically this thing that we just stick signatures into. Um, and it's, it's not garbage collected, so I think it's actually a memory leak. Um, so we also have, we have five function objects. And these are, our, um, these, are the, these are compiled by the evaluator. And then they're later executed. So we have, first of all, we have a function body. And this is used by procedure. And this is the actual code that a procedure is going to execute. Then we have a procedure. And what a procedure is, as we said, is a function and an environment. We have lambda. What lambda is as a function object is a, a lambda, lambda here is a compiled lambda expression. The, it's not the result of a lambda, which would be a procedure, but it's a, it's a compiled lambda expression, which would be executed and would return a procedure itself. Then we have placeholders. This is what we use to implement lexical addressing. If you've got a, you know, a, a um, plus x2, then x is replaced with a placeholder that refers to where it is. And when the function is executed, that placeholder is evaluated. And we also have a thunk, which is a slightly hacky thing that um, is used to delay evaluation of a lambda expression, which is necessary when you have a nested lambda expression, or any lambda expression, actually. All right, so. Um, we're going through our data structures here. We've got our already type, it's fixed or variable. Um, our function type, for our purposes, we're just going to ignore function types that aren't placeholders. Um, in the actual code, we have to know um, about various other function types for other purposes. Um, we have some type def for displacement, which is missing a terminating uh, bracket, not uh, bracket, uh, semicolon. Then we have a signature. The signature is a displacement, um, already info, and a function type. Now our environment structure, this primarily has three, three methods, three members. It's got an unordered map that's mapping U-trees to shared pointers that are U-trees. It's got a shared pointer to an environment, which is, which is its parent, and then it has a weak pointer to this, which is the procedure that this environment exists for. And that's um, how the cyclic dependencies are avoided. Um, I haven't actually finished implementing that. So there are still cyclic dependencies. Um, next we have the scope, which is our runtime environment. And this is a shared array of U trees. And it also holds a shared pointer to its parent scope and a displacement. 
um, which is its, its level, um, the frame that it's at. Um, I probably should have changed this to std vector. I have problems with std vector. So thus I have a hand rolled vector that's used here. Um, but just consider a global procedure table a vector of signatures. Um, the eval I'm sorry, I can't help it. Ooh, what's your problem with std vector? I can't specify the growth size, the, the, the factor by which it grows. Okay. Um, but uh, so the, the evaluator holds a shared pointer to it, its variables. It holds a shared pointer to its global procedure t table. And it holds the frame that it's at. Um, remember that the environment holds a reference to its parent environment. So the evaluator holds not a reference to the, its parent evaluator, but to its parent environment. Um, so then we have a, another vector that's holding code, which is uTrees. And that's what the function body is, is it's basically just code. And a procedure is a function body and an environment and a signature. Well, um, the signature could actually be removed because we could just look it up in the global procedure table. But uh, that's not something I've done yet. So a lambda is just a reference to a function body or to a function body. And that's the function body that when the lambda expression is evaluated, it creates a procedure with that function body and that signature. And it binds the environment in which the lambda expression is currently in. Then we have a placeholder, which is just a um, where, you know, what level, which um, argument am I at, and then what frame am I at. And finally, we have a, a thunk, which is code and a global procedure table. And what a thunk is, is it's just something that's delaying evaluation from happening in the evaluator to happening when the thunk is executed. All right, so these are the algorithms that we need to implement. We need to be able to compile a lambda expression. This consists of making placeholders and compiling the lambda body. We need to evaluate variable references. We need to evaluate procedure calls. And that means we have to be able to evaluate a function. And we need to be able to evaluate a compiled lambda, which means we have to evaluate a placeholder, evaluate a thunk, and make lazy calls with the thunk. So this is the code that evaluates the lambda expression. So it receives the formals, which are the arguments of the lambda. And it gets the body, which is just the U-tree that represents the body. It's not the body and the formals. Neither have been compiled yet. They're both just symbols and strings and numbers. Um, they, if they were compiled, they would just be functions. So the first thing we do is we create um, a local environment. We do that by creating an evaluator that will, it passes variables to um, the, its own variables, which creates a new variables instance and tells that variables instance that the parent, that, that the parameter variables is its parent. Then we pass the global procedure table. All the evaluators, no matter what scope you're at, share the same global procedure table. And then we, we tell the um, new environment that its depth is whatever our depth is plus one. So next we want to make the placeholders. That's um, the function that we'll go, go to next. And what that consists of is installing in the compile time environment mappings that map the symbol names of um, the formals to the placeholders. So next we make a function body. And we go through the body and we evaluate each element of the body. And this is creating the actual function body. Then we down here, we create the lambda. And this piece of code here is storing the signature of the lambda in the global procedure table. And then we just return the U tree that we've created with the lambda. So this is the code that makes our placeholders. So it receives a list of formals, and it goes to the formals. And for each formal, it defines a placeholder function that's bound to the name of the formal. And there's very, I've left all the um, 
checking code and all the error handling code out of all these examples. So some of these are dangerous and would segfault on um, incorrect code, but the actual code has um, all the error handling in there. So, so right here we, we just read it fine. Um, we, we're assuming here that all of the formals are symbols. It would obviously be an error if they weren't. And then for each, sim, for each placeholder, we also put it into the global procedure table. All right, so evaluating the lambda body. Now the lambda body is some, something that we don't, we want to evaluate it, but we do not want to execute it. Because we want it to be executed when the, the lambda returns a procedure. We want the function body to be executed when the procedure returned by the lambda is executed. So that's where the thunk comes into things. So we start off by, we make a code type, which is a vector of u trees. And that's just a predicate that determines if the body is a um, container, then it's, it's not an actual operator name, and it might be a lambda. We have to go and evaluate it if it's a lambda. And if not, we just evaluate it normally. So this builds a lazy call, where it, it puts all the functions um, into this, this vector of u trees. And then when we pass it to the thunk, the thunk will not execute it. But when, when we execute the thunk, um, the code will be executed. And the thunk is what we return here. So evaluating a variable reference is very simple. We look it up in the uh, current scope. And the lookup procedure that's calling it on the environment, looking up on an environment, if it finds it in its current scope and its current mappings, then it returns it. If not, it asks its, it asks its parent and so on and so forth. So that um, it'll find a higher level binding if it's there. But local bindings can shadow um, higher level bindings. So this is on the, the procedure function object, um, which it inherits from a CRTP base class, which has the actual operator um, the call operator, which forwards to this eval. So evaluating procedure consists of, if, if the args aren't empty, if the, the environment that's been passed, then we need to get a reference to the environment. Scope is not passed as a um, shared pointer for historical reasons. Um, but it, it, because it inherits from enabled shared from this, we can um, get a shared pointer from it. So once we have we've got another reference to the environment. Then we want to create our new scope and we want to evaluate the body with our new scope. And the new scope, um, the parent environment is the stored environment. So if it's a null and error, it's a lot simpler. We don't have to um, do the checkout of the args because they don't matter. Um, and we, that, that'll allow them to be garbage collected earlier. So in a function body, this is where the actual execution happens. Everything else has just been returning things that execute things that eventually execute a function body. So function body, you, you start off here, you get the size of the how many different functions you have to execute. The last function is the one that we're going to return its value, but we want to execute all of them to ensure that side effects happen. So we, we go through this loop and we execute um, up to the last one if they're functions. If they're not functions, um, then they're just values which have no meaning because we're not returning them. So the last one, if it's a function, we evaluate it and execute it. And if it's a just a value, variable reference, we just return it. So this is the lambda, um, which builds the procedure, which builds the function body. Probably should have reversed the order on those. Um, so the, the lambda, it will take the current environment that it's in, and if it's the top level environment, it just takes that environment. And if it's not the top level environment, it takes the parent of the top level environment. Um, that's because you, it wants to ignore the environment that the lambda itself was called for, because otherwise you throw off the um, lexical addressing because you end up with an empty environment interleaved in between each actual environment. 
So then we, we create a func function base, and this is the base class that all uTree function objects have to inherit from. Um, and we, we store a procedure in this function base, and we're, we're using a, this stored function which inherits from function base, and it's just a, a class that fulfills function bases, virtual, pure virtual methods, and just invokes this procedure, and it holds the procedure by value. So then we return a uTree that holds this function base. So evaluating your placeholder is relatively easy. As I, as I mentioned, it uses the lexical scoping. So we, we get the current environment, we check if the current environment matches, if, if the level of the current environment matches the level of the placeholder. If not, we ask for the outer environment until we get to the right environment. Then we just um, return the argument at the right, um, the right position in that in. So this is the code that does the lazy evaluation. So it's got a vector of u trees, um, all of which are either functions that have been compiled or just values, like literal values. So we, we start off by the new environment that we're going to make to execute this lazy call is going to be, we don't want to have the first argument, which is the actual operator, be in the environment. So we create a shared array that's the size of the um, storage for the um, call, minus one. Then we, uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, we, so we go through here and um, until we, we meet, meet the end, we put into the environment, um, we evaluate with this eval lazy call, which is in the next slide. And we do i plus one, because we want to skip over the, argu the first um, argument, which is the operator. So then if we, we check if the um, operator, which we got up here, we check if it's a function. If it's not a function, if it's not a function, we just return it. And otherwise, we allocate a new scope. And we stick this shared array into the new scope. And then we um, evaluate the lazy function. So this is the, the execution of the actual lazy arguments. Um, so we, we go through, and if it's a function, we execute it. If it's not a function, we just return a reference to it. All right, so this is the, uh, the, the API that we have, which is it creates an evaluator, and then it evaluates it with this huge visitation. Um, and that's actually pretty much all I have. How am I for time? Uh, all right, do people have questions? Yep. No, I'll, I'll take a shot. I was, I was trying to figure out your, your use of uh, U tree here. And I guess it's because um, I was just thinking about your grammar and, and the, the, um, the, uh, the attribute grammar, mm -hmm. I guess. And um, I was thinking that I normally prefer to, like, one of the things I really like about Spirit is that. Uh, on the left hand side I can put my own, you know, class right. and types and stuff like that. And I was like, well Utree is so generic. So I guess the reason you do that is because you're you're parsing a language which can literally have anything there, right? You know, like right. that child thing can be anything. So which is why you're using Utree or, or one of the reasons. Uh yeah. Um the the question was um what why am I using uh Utree here when it, it's mm -hmm. so generic instead of using my own um my own structure for the attributes. The, it's a matter of the reuse of code. And um, I, mean, I mean that for what, why would I want to write my own um, node when I have this thing that can, as you say, can essentially represent anything that you want it to. At the very least, you can store um, any arbitrary type with the any pointer which it uses runtime type information, but it's just doing a pointer comparison. Um, it's not comparing the actual strings, so it's relatively fast. Between that and tagging, you can pretty much store whatever you want in uTree. Um, but I mean, I mean, on the other hand, it is sort of a, a closed system that um, 
for some for a U tree to hold something, it pretty much has to be another U tree or one of the preset um, types. So it, it's you can't add a a, a new type to U tree. Um, it's not extensible in that fashion, uh, and I don't think we have any plans to make it extensible in that fashion. Not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> Question called for you to, to chat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the main reason I use semi extra especially is because I want to use a conversion from the pass tree to the ASC on the fly. Mm -hmm. In your situation, your pass tree and your, and your ASC is the same thing. Right. Um, so, so the the question was that um, Mathis was asking that when he, he wants to use semantic actions, it's because he wants to build the AST from the parse tree, whereas here, the parse tree and the AST are represented by the same thing. Is that? Yeah. Um, so there, there is a little bit of ambiguity as to if U-tree is a parse tree or an AST. Um, I kind of see it as both. Um, and in the Lisp example, the, the, AS, uh, the actual parse tree that I get back from the parser is not the same as the AST. The AST is the function tree that I've built with all these compiled functions. And it's the, um, you know, it's once I've got all the signatures stored. So I'm using the same type to build my AST and my parse tree, but they're two separate things. The parse tree doesn't contain any function nodes, doesn't, doesn't contain any function nodes whatsoever. Um, whereas the um, AST does contain prim primarily function nodes. Um, and it also contains constants and literals, but those are all not the same as in the um, the AST. So they're two separate structures. But I, I mean, I, I my my case to you would be that there's no reason to not just generate your parse tree with Spirit and then later transform it to uh, from from the just the raw parse tree into a, a later form of the AST. There's nothing wrong with doing multiple passes. You don't have to try to build your AST um, in the same step when you're doing parsing. I mean for for simple examples you can do that. This is less but it's, it's relatively easy to parse this. But for more complex languages you, you're gonna need to do multiple passes um, of the parse tree and of the AST. And I think one of, the, one of the things that I see a lot of people try to do is try to do too much in the parse path, in the parse st stage. They, they want to they have what's returned by Qui be their final AST product. When in fact, in some cases, it is better to get a raw tree, something that's, that's not exactly what you want, and then later refine it through visitors or through some sort of um, iteration. Uh, hope that answers your question. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah? Any other C++ implementations? I don't know of any. Um, I've, I've actually, I, I've had trouble see, finding many Lisp implementations that are not um, predominantly implemented in Lisp. Uh, Lisp. Lisp packers seem to enjoy writing the minimal amount of assembly needed to bootstrap a Lisp interpreter. Um, it was it was challenging for me because I was working off of the purple book, which is a great resource, but all of the examples are parsing Lisp or interpreting Lisp from Lisp, so it's kind of tricky when you're doing it from C++. Um, and and I mean it, it's I think for the most part most languages that are compiled or interpreted um, are done in their own in the language themselves, um, but we we wanted to. We want to have this as something that's closely tied with C++ so that, you know, if, if I wanted to ask a user to give me a function object to use as a callback for something, I could do it with this. Um, yeah. But I mean, I could do it from C++. Like, I could just um, link against this library, you know, the list library, and just call evaluate on some U tree or on some, some input source and just get back a function object. Plus, uh, I mean, we, we have a very diverse um, source of, of library features, which is Boost. You know, I, I'm, I'm able 
to, to implement file system operations with Boost File System, um, I/O with Boost I/O streams, you know, ACO for async I/O and for networking. You've got MPI into process. All of these libraries, which it's pretty trivial to implement um, uh, an API for them in this little language. So I, I think Boost is a great resource for building a language, not just because of um, the utilities for building the compiler, but, but because it has many great libraries to expose to the language itself. Anyone else? All right. Uh, yeah. Is uh, U-Tree move enabled? Um, is, the question was, is U-Tree move enabled, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not right now. That's something that Hartman and I talked about before BoostCon. Um, I think that's probably something that will happen in the near future. I, I, don't, I don't know what the status is of Boost Move. And I don't, I mean, I, I don't think we can really have it move enabled with Boost Move until... Because otherwise, do you not end up doing a lot of copies? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the other reason why I use copious um, shared pointers um, to avoid copy overhead. Uh, but that's, that's something that I'm not too knowledge about, uh, knowledgeable about, but um, it's definitely in the future plans for U-Tree. Uh, I mean, I, 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 is Boost Move accepted? Yeah. Is, is it in the trunk? Or? I don't know. Right. Um, so, so in that in that case, that's something that I'll probably um, do very soon because the the copying is is one of the big gotchas with Utree. Uh, in the like original version of this, I couldn't figure out why it was using like 200, 300, 400 kilobytes of me memory. 4,000 kilobytes of memory for like factorial and it turned out that it was just because I was doing some copying that was I had assumed was being moved. Um, so that, that's when I started using the smart pointer um, copiously. Alright, anybody else? Okay, I think I'm pretty much all set. There's the link for the source code for this. Um, I don't think it'll compile in Visual Studio, but uh, you can go and pull it and build it on Mac.